Good morning. I'm glad you can take a moment to uh, join for a bit of worship this weekend. One announcement that we need to make. Uh, Christmas Eve is coming, and we have two options to offer the community uh, coming up here. On the 21st, we're going to offer a drive-in Christmas Eve. So drive uh, in, park in the parking lot of the Fellowship Hall, and we're going, I'm going to have a radio transmitter, and you'll be able to see me. I, I don't know if I'll stand under the overhang of the fellowship hall or, or up high on the stairs here. Uh, it will depend on the weather. But um, you'll be able to turn your radio, tune your radio in, and in the safety and warmth of your car, be able to join in a moment of worship. I want to make sure we offer this particular approach to worship because I am aware that there are people who are immunocompromised, who are sick, who have been grappling with all the things that life brings on top of the, the COVID-19 problems of, of this year. And so this is a service on December 21st that is specifically targeted to make sure that everyone who wants to have an opportunity to worship at Christmas can do so. And so that's December 21st, 6 p.m., pull up, park in the parking lot, off we'll go. The second option is going to be December 24th, again at 6 o'clock, and we're going to Sing Silent Night. There'll be some candles. Uh, I'll have a few words to say as we uh, read the gospel of the birth of Jesus Christ. I anticipate that that will be outside. It depends on the positivity rate for the county. If it drops dramatically, we might be inside. But on December 24th at 6 p.m., we will worship here in person, whether it is outside in a circle around a fire pit uh, or it's inside this sanctuary. I don't know. We'll have to see. Please join me in praying that uh, we don't have rain, because that really is the worst case scenario all the way around. We will have worship um, both of those nights, though. 21st, drive in, 6 p.m., 24th, in person. Uh, dress for the weather, because we might be outside. If the positivity rate drops dramatically, we'll be inside with masks, socially distanced. We do have a family to read and to light the Advent wreath this Sunday. So uh, please join me as we hear the words of God for us, the people of God. This is a reading from Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. Some men came down from Judea to Annie. <laughs> Take three. Why? Because I messed up of pronunciation. This is a reading from Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the brothers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the laws of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are.
Imagine that you have decided to take a cruise. COVID is all over. You can travel safely now. And you've always wanted to go up to Alaska and take an Alaskan cruise. And so you go up and you get, uh, let's say, your Norwegian cruise line. They're doing a two for one special, trying to drive some traffic, trying to drive some sales, right? And so you and 2,375 people, your new best friends, get on the Norwegian Jewel and cruise out of Alaska for a lengthy journey. Halfway through the cruise, though, the unimaginable happens. Now, I admit this is the point at which I really wish I had a congregation in front of me because I'd, I'd want to ask, like, pick your disaster. Who here wants it to be an iceberg? You know, the classic. You hit an iceberg. You're up near Alaska. It's cold. Or do you want it to be like a meteorite comes zipping out of the sky and just knocks a hole in the boat? And, and, and so pick your disaster. Because I don't get to ask anyone, we're going to go with the classic iceberg. We'll, we'll go with that, right? So we'll have a, an iceberg. The Norwegian jewel hits this iceberg in the middle of the night. And you are on the boat. And the word starts to pass through the, all the 2,376 passengers that the boat is going to sink. It's sinking slowly, but it is going to sink. And in the middle of this dire situation, the intercom crackles to life and you hear a radio transmission. You hear a, a, a voice say, Norwegian Jewel, the crackle, 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 crackle is inbound and we will be there in five days. So you know help is coming. The radio transmission crackled in the middle of saying who it was that was coming, but you know that help is indeed coming. So what happens next? What happens next? We know what happens next because we have watched the disaster films of the late 90s. Or if you prefer, there was a bunch of disaster films in the 70s as well. But they all seem to be have a similar logic. I admit I've seen a lot more of the 90s ones. Uh, the Armageddon, Deep Impact, Twister, Dante's Peak, Volcano, there are many more of them. In the 70s, it was the Poseidon Adventure, the Towering Inferno Earthquake. I've not seen the ones from the 70s, as I, as, as I said. I have a feeling that the main, main difference was not in plot, but was in the size of the special effects budget spent. Each, all these movies have the same general plot, though, right? A disaster is going to strike, uh, whether it's a tsunami or tornado or volcanic eruption, something bad is about to happen. And there are always the same group of characters. There's the person who saw it coming that no one listened to. Right? There are the two leaders who are arguing about what we should do. And then there's the person who makes the heroic sacrifice. Right? We, we can go through and we can list off all these different tropes, all the different characters characters that are always going to show up in these movies. And at the base of all these movies was the assumption was that not everyone was going to make it. Right? There was this fear. Right? There isn't enough capacity to save everyone. Not everyone's going to make it. Some people are going to die in this, and who is it going to be? Like, that's the driving force of these, movie, these disaster movies. So going back to our imaginary cruise that has taken a very bad turn, you're on the ship, the Norwegian Jewel, you and 2,375 of your not quite as good friends now, what happens? You have to survive for five days while someone, unknown person, unknown rescuer comes your way, and, and that unknown rescuer is going to show up in how many will be saved. It depends who's coming, doesn't it? All right. If the radio message turns out to be that there is a small group of fishing vessels that are on the way, and each fishing boat can take about 20 people, five of them, right? Then you're looking at 100 people going to be saved out of 2,376 plus all the people who are crewing the boat too, right? So there's a lot more people, probably more like 3,000. And in that situation, that's going to get ugly. Then it starts to look like those disaster movies. There are going to be disagreements, and those disagreements 
are going to turn to violence, it's going to be a hard moment, right? That's how I can imagine that unfolding. Disagreements that because there's that pressure that not everyone's going to make it, right? Disagreements turn to violence. But on the other hand, if the radio message is that the Coast Guard is on the way and that they are fully prepared to save every person on board, they will tow the ship back, right? They'll seal the hole. They will send people who are hurt on massive helicopters that can carry as many people as are needed, right? That's a different matter altogether, isn't it? In that situation, the 200, 2,376 people, like, they're going to disagree about how to spend those five days. Some of them are want to get organized, and some of them are want to get organized in, in other ways, and some people are just going to hunker down in their bunks and just do their own thing, right? But everyone who wants to be saved will be saved as long as they're willing to get up and walk off the boat. That's all they have to do. They just have to be able to get up and walk off the boat because it's not the fishermen who are showing up who can just take a few 20, 30, 100 people. It's the Coast Guard, and they're going to be able to take everybody. Right? So think about how those two situations are different. One is waiting where disagreements would lead to violence. One is waiting where disagreements would lead to well, you're just disagreeing. You do it your way, I'll do it my way, and then the Coast Guard's still coming for us. My friends, for centuries, the way that the church has been represented in art and understood in general is as a boat, right? It's not a, just, it's for that reason, like this cruise ship analogy just makes sense to me. The, the church has been understood to be a boat, a boat that is taking people, the people who follow Jesus, taking us towards the kingdom of God. And when it comes to the question of who is going to be saved, right, is, is Jesus functioning like a small group of fishing vessels that can only save a small percentage of people on the boat? Or is Jesus like the Coast Guard? who is there to tow the entire boat to safety, and everyone that, everyone that is willing to get up and walk off the boat is going to be saved. Advent is the season of waiting, and I think it matters that we are clear how it is we, do, we wait, how it is we are waiting. What are we looking towards in, in the future? Right? Are we waiting with a fear that there is not going to be enough, and, and thus our fear and our, our, this experience of scarcity drives us for, to, drives that waiting to potentially become violent and, and, and fracture us? Or are we waiting as people who have this sure and certain hope that when Jesus shows up, it's like the Coast Guard and everyone is going to be fine? All right. If we wait in fear, worried that there's not going to be enough to, for everyone to be saved, all right, that, that's, that's going to look very different, isn't it? We're, that's going to look very different from waiting in confidence that, that Jesus is going to save everyone who is willing to say that Jesus is Lord and turn to him and follow. And as an example of this, what this looks like, that's why we turn to Acts 15 today, which is admittedly not something we probably hear often in the month of December as we prepare for Christmas, but it does seem to be a fitting uh, moment because what's happening in Acts 15? The book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, is the book that explains the history of the early church. And in this moment in Acts 15, we have the first major council of the church. They have to decide, in a sense, how will they wait? And this is a disagreement that is led by uh, the two major people, two major characters, Peter and Paul. Now, Peter and Paul are a fascinating uh, couple to think about, these, these two people, because they're, they're mirrors of each other in some ways. Peter was raised working with his hands, prepared to make a living by the sweat of his brow, right? And he has moved to Jerusalem, and now he has moved into the city where the leaders of the country are, where the, the, the priests and the military leaders and the governance are all, government is all there. And so he's leading this church surrounded by and working with people of power who are very different from him, not how he was raised. Paul 
was raised in Jerusalem. Paul was raised to work with his mind and to be around all those people that Peter now is around. And Paul has gone and he has been sent out. Now he is a tent maker. He is going from place to place and he is working with his hands so that he can sit down and work with people and be able to introduce them to who Jesus is. So, so Peter and Paul are fascinating because they're both born, they were born in opposite sort of ends of the uh, cultural experience, social stru structure, and they've sort of switched places. And, and so both of them ha have been called to stretch and to grow and to understand far more than what they grew up with. And so here they are, the two leaders of the church, on the boat, and they have to decide how are we, how are we going to handle this challenge of what do we expect of people? Right? We're, we're disagreeing about what we expect of people. How do we handle this, this disagreement? Right? And the disagreement is, do we require everyone who wants to follow Jesus, do they, are they required to learn and to abide by all of the cultural norms and practices of the Jewish people? Or do they, we need to, so you have to become Jewish before you can follow Jesus? Or, or as Paul argues, do you need to focus on following Jesus and you have to understand the prophets in the Old Testament to understand who Jesus is, but you don't have to become Jewish first. Let's focus on following Jesus. All right. And what is at stake here? Like, if they decide one way or the other, does that mean that there's not going to be enough room on the boat for the other? Like, that, that's the question. Are, are they going to uh, wait on Jesus saying that this is the right way and you can't be on the boat because you're wrong, right? Is, is that how they're going to handle their disagreement? Are they afraid that there's not going to be enough salvation to go around? Right? We have to do it this way and you're wrong, so you're damned. Or we have to do it this way and you're wrong, so you're damned. We disagree, so you're off the boat, right? Thankfully, the church of Jesus does not function like a disaster movie. We don't have to make decisions based upon fear and scarcity. We don't have to wait as people who are afraid there's not going to be enough Jesus, there's not going to be enough salvation to go around. We don't have to wait being afraid that if someone disagrees with us, that somehow now there's not going to be enough salvation, right? Peter and Paul come to this broad agreement that we still turn back to today. That while we wait for Jesus to return, you are free to follow Jesus how you choose. Here are the broad guidelines we would like you to follow. We, we need you to follow these broad guidelines. Right? Don't fall into idolatry. Don't break cultural norms in a way that make it impossible for us to stay together as a church family. Receive the gift of sexuality and handle it with integrity. And if you can do those three things, then... Let's, we're on this boat together. There's enough Jesus to go around. We can disagree about a lot of things. We're going to follow Jesus and, and agree about we follow Jesus. We'll do these three things together. Here we go. It's going to be just fine. Peter and Paul understand that it is not something where one side has to win and so that the other side loses. It's that there are, they are two branches of the same family. They can disagree about how they follow Jesus. It can look different as long as those broad norms, right? That uh, don't fall into idolatry, don't abuse social norms. Don't, don't, those uh, receive the gift of sexuality with seriousness and, and take it. Like, as long as you can do those three things, follow Jesus. And if you do it differently than I do, that's okay, right? We're all on the same boat heading towards the same place. The unity they have is a unity they receive as people who follow Jesus, and they understand that uni unity does not mean un uniformity. The unity we have as Christians is that we follow Jesus. To have unity does not mean we have to have uniformity. The Jewish Christians are going to follow and wait for Jesus in a way that looks different than how the Gentile Christians do, and that is just fine. There's enough salvation to go around. This Advent season, 
we are again reminded that we are people of patience. We are people who wait. And that this waiting is of a particular type. We do not wait as people who are afraid. We do not wait as people about who have to worry about whether there's going to be enough, trying to prove that my way of waiting is right and, and that those who disagree with me are wrong and, and they don't deserve to be saved. Right? We wait as people who trust in the abundance of Jesus, that anyone who chooses to follow him, to, to wait on him, is going to be saved. And that's the good news. We're waiting on Jesus to come, and there is plenty of Jesus to go around. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, as we wait, may we wait in trust, buoyed by hope, sustained knowing that what you bring us is not a limited resource, that your forgiveness, your grace is sufficient for anyone who receives your good news. And so help us to wait as peaceful and peaceable people. Help us to receive the gift of others as Peter and Paul received each other, being able to ce celebrate that people can follow you differently, trusting that in you we have unity. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now may the peace of, uh, peace of our Lord Jesus Christ sustain you this day and always. Go forth now in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>